This is Ocean to Ocean for Nothing Media. And we're going to have a talk with Ben Finca. Is that the right way to pronounce it? Cool, cool. Yeah, Ben is someone who um, I think, I believe from our previous talks, he told me since junior high that a sort of seeking began, or maybe even younger. Yeah? I Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was just saying it was in high school. Oh, high school. Okay, cool. Yeah, that there was, um, yeah, that you were drawn to, well, actually, you could start the conversation yourself. <laughs> Tell me, um, how did you begin as a seeker? And, you know, you can go from there. Um, well, I guess the, like, thing that kind of, like, I guess, like, turned on that light or whatever was, um, it was actually when I was a senior in high school, uh, the English class I was in, we read Siddhartha by Herman Hess, and that was just sort of an introduction to... I guess, thinking of life in a different way. I don't know. Because, uh, I don't know, I was a really frustrated kid and um, not very good self-esteem. And so I was definitely like looking for answers in a way, looking for meaning in a way, and then also just looking for identity as well. Um, I don't know. I feel like it started in a very mundane manner, perhaps even. But it's interesting that that is fact, though, because after being introduced to thinking differently or thinking more deeply or however you want to say, um, the next thing that I was introduced to was Alan Watt. And then I happened to find um, Prior to Consciousness by Nizhigurdada Maharaj at the flea market. Wow. And yeah, from there, like. That's a big I jump. Kind of like, that, yeah, I just kind of like. Going from, off Alan Watts, like a, going from Alan Watts to prior to consciousness, that's kind of a, a big jump almost. To, to yeah, well, I mean, in, in, in like a span of like probably months, I went from nothing like that to. Siddhartha to Alan Watt to Music Gadada. So when you first started reading that Miss Argadada book, did it make sense? Did it just seem crazy? Was what, what was your what was your learning curve or initial feeling about um, it? Well, I think that's actually asking if it makes sense is pretty perfect because that's I think a good way of describing my like initial approach like trying to make sense of things yeah and so i think that that is a little bit of how i approached that book as well as approach <laughs> alan watt as in like in terms of like trying to make sense of it trying to piece it all together and i, I think it's still something that i have a tendency to do but um uh, yeah just like trying to make sure i am like i have a firm grasp or whatever like uh, a, a solid conceptual logical network of ideas or whatever. Right. And, and how has that changed over the years? Um, Cause you said, <clears throat> is it still, you said there's a part of you that still enjoys that or does that, but is there some, how, how has that changed now? Um, I think it's, it's kind of that I, I am just not as expectant. I'm not expecting as much from it. Um, 
Yeah. I think, I, I guess, like, to put it really short, I've just, like, overall calmed down. Um, like, I still have my time, but I'm just not as, I, I, I'm trying to find a better way to put it, but I guess just, like, I'm just not as, like, attached to it. Like, yeah. it's something that just kind of happened through me. And yeah. I, I guess, like, in the past, like, I, I would want to, like, try and get recognition or I would try and get, like, at least acknowledgement or whatever for, like, understanding things. Um, but I'm just not as concerned with that anymore, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it's... Um... Yeah, well, with Nisargadatta in particular, and let's say that book, which I'm a little familiar with, I mean, his language can be so, it can make it sound pretty complicated if you're trying to understand it all intellectually, because he uses a lot of different words, like awareness and consciousness, which he has very separate definitions for. And then all the, there's quite a cosmology almost to the way he puts things. And yet, I feel like, um, you know, the, what he's really trying to get across is is not in any of those concepts. It's it's much simpler. Yeah, and that's that's something that did stand out from the beginning, um, because um, I wasn't just reading Nizagadara. That was also paired with Alan Watt. So yeah. I was like. Uh, you're familiar with Alan Watts. He's very logical. He's very philosophical. Um, and, he, and he also, yeah. he, he has a beautiful way of putting things in layman's terms, really. Sure, yeah. He doesn't over so, yeah, with language. Yeah. yeah. But I was, anyway, reading Alan Watts and Nizagradara at the same time. And so... Um, yeah, I mean, it's just like I was trying to understand it, trying to like put all the pieces together. And I think that was helpful to an extent because, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just like with the way I see like teachings at this point is that um, there are stories which help loosen your grip on other stories, something we've talked about before. Yeah. Um, understanding and like having a degree of understanding of like the teachings or whatever i guess like i don't know for like a really basic example just like acknowledging that things are impermanent like yeah acknowledging yeah. that things will wear wear down and break and you'll have to do maintenance and it's not always going to be new like, that's always prevalent in life because, like, I like computers, I like my stereo system, I like my car. I mean, e even just any everyday thing, there has to be maintenance. It's, uh, yeah. And so it's just, like, taking things that, I guess, could be, in a way, very basic, but then applying it in a very deep way to your own psyche and your own life and like just that gradual process of challenging your complexes your stories that bind you or cause you grief in whatever various way like, yes yeah, so with the yeah. example you gave of um you know acknowledging the impermanence and the deterioration of all things physical um how would so you're saying that there was a moment where maybe you had a that occurred to you and something changed um that's the thing is i don't feel so much like i, I hear a lot about like people having experiences or having aha moments and i feel like i maybe have had some moments but they're never really 
so related to like understanding how things work. It's usually more of like an emotional thing, like letting myself out emotions. And so like, yeah, just like, I don't know, like breaking down crying or things like that. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. There's something beneficial in having and acknowledging and trying to express in a healthy way your emotions. Uh, like yeah. That's, that's something, um, something that I, I actually also ran into pretty early on was Osho. And I feel that what I took from that was uh, a lot of his ideas around not not repressing things. Uh, right. And so, yeah, I I guess when I have had things that felt like an intellectual breakthrough or like a psychological breakthrough, it was usually more, I just became fixated on an idea, I think. And it was like attractive at the time and evoked a lot of emotion at the time. But I mean, it's just not lasting, right? I mean, there's the continuing inertia of the patterns that have built up over years, right? Yeah, these, yeah, for me, it's like sort of noticing that those patterns are just doing what they do. And, you know, it might feel like there's someone changing it in this way or that. But then that's just another thought. That's just another feeling. It's, um, it's, it's all, it, I mean, it really just feels like it's all just doing itself to me. But, and if you think about it logically, I guess, you know, it's, there's genetics, there's your environment, we're speaking English, we didn't come up with this language, you know, we, we might put our own little subtle variation on our, on how we say words, but, and which words we choose over other words, but even that, it's not really a choice, it's things that are, even that probably just comes from our environment and, you know, yeah, and just, what, who knows what? I mean, even when I say that's something I guess Ramesh said was up to date conditioning and genetics is causing everything. Nisar Gadotic called it food going in and food going out of the body, like all influences taken in, going back out in some variation. Um, yeah, but I don't even know if any of that's ultimately true. There, but But when you think about things that way, it does relax the feeling of um like there's no it's i don't know what, what what does that bring to your mind those those ideas um well i i had in mind a comment on uh, from before um we were talking about how um in my experiences, there's not really been like any lasting intellectual change that I like keep with me. Um, right. What I think that kind of points out is that, uh, I mean, it's again back to the kind of impermanent thing. It's like, I think a tendency of a lot of people, and definitely myself in the past more so, um, is to try and find like some lasting. Thing, or like some thought or like some way of thinking of things that like fixes it. Like if only I can like see it this way or think of it this way and maintain that space it evokes or whatever, then it will be okay. And then we get frustrated when we can't yeah. maintain it forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, on the extreme end of this sort of thing, topic you're bringing up, I, I've heard of at least one person who sort of claimed to have some sort of shift and awakening that 
you know, they remained aware of and spoke about. And then, but they were, they were older. And at a certain point they got um, dementia or something like this. And it appeared that it went away, you know, it, to them and to others, perhaps, you know, and, you know, the idea that um, there's something outside of the brain that can know this, you know, this, and yeah, I don't feel like the brain is the thing knowing this either. And I don't think there's anything to know. So it, it's all pretty paradoxical, but what you're saying about the impermanence, I think that's kind of a very grounding example, just knowing that, you know, our brains, which give us the ability to speak and talk like this really, and point to what we're saying can't really be put into words. You know, how that very brain can actually deteriorate you know, in old age, you know, and and then somehow appear to not know this anymore. But the funny thing is, there's nothing to know. And it's really like the body is just doing what it does. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing with like, trying to understand how it works is like, you can you can have like, your best guesses and they're all probably like right and wrong, right? Uh, but it's uh, yeah, going to be perfect. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by the best guesses are right and wrong? Um, well, just in that you can look at anything from like innumerable perspectives. And so something as simple as like two plus two equals four, like everyone will pretty much agree that that's correct but that's only because of like you were saying like we're speaking english we're thinking with these numerals that humans have made up and like we made up these rules of like what these symbols mean yeah and like mathematics at all um yeah and uh yeah like the, so there is a perspective from which like it would feasibly make sense that two plus two equals, I don't know, 7,000, like whatever you want, because in the end, it's just convention. It's just like an agreed upon way of doing things that isn't objective, really. It's an attempt to be objective, but I mean, it's just like any, like any mode of measurement, there's margin of error, right? Yeah, so, so is, is anything objective? Here, can we pause it? <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah, I mean, is, is anything of this? Um, well, I mean, it's the same as anything, yes and no, because in that we are getting as close as we can get being logical and being observant and like whatever um that's still like we would call that objective from like a scientific perspective like if it's something that we can measure something that we can like see and like decide is it's under the box into the box of tangible um then we call that objective but that's still just our our symbolism, our representational, conceptual uh, inter interpretation of things. It's not how things actually are. Uh, like we can try and be objective and say that like this table is so many inches long, but like I was saying, there's always margin of error. Like even things that seem simple as like saying this is a window, like that's a general concept. Each instance is an individual, which is infinitely different if you look to the right degree of detail, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, it's just pointing out that the realm of thought and, like, the realm of, like, consciousness or whatever are, like, separate. Then again, that's also just concept, just a way of understanding a way of measuring and uh yeah that's what it means to me when when it's said that like 
it can't be said or it can't be known or things like that. It's like very logically because anything known is uh, dualistic. Right. right. It's finite. Is uh, it has boundaries. Um, there's a conceptual pattern which like denotes this is it, this is not it. Uh, which is all, yeah, like I said, it's all imposition, it's all interpretation. It's not raw. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and you, you mentioned earlier how, you know, it, something about these, this, I don't even know what to call this, what you're talking, what we're talking about, I guess we could say non-duality, that's what it's going to say in the title of the video, probably, but you, these discussions on non-duality and impermanence and whatever you want to call it, you said somehow this has brought about an emotion, emotional changes for you or bouts of crying, maybe like a release of stored emotion or or uh, maybe like even unproductive thought patterns that were released. Maybe I'm I'm sort of get inter inferring from what you said. I'm so I I'm curious. Like, how do you? Yeah, would you care to expound on that a little bit more? Sure. Um, yeah. Um, well, everyone has their own like stories their own complexes, their own way of looking at life, the things that are relevant to them, um, their relationships that they have in mind, like just their like entire conceptual associated map of their psyche, of their psychology, of their understanding of life in the world. And I think that um, so someone, someone that I've been exposed to, I've never actually read anything from her, just bits on Facebook, but uh, Byron Katie yeah. and her work. I, I, lo I um, love Byron Katie. Yeah, and yeah I, I, I really resonate with that. Yeah. And it, it's like the teachings are just a way to challenge your thoughts. And... Uh, from there, it's just like a gradual process of like, for instance, like I've dealt with and still do deal with like a lot of guilt and like fear. And like, I can be pretty defensive and get pretty angry. Um, and there's always stories around those feelings, around those situations. Like, who am I in the situation? Who who is the other person in the situation, or whoever else, or whatever else is involved, and like what is happening, and like having those negative reactions, having those negative emotions. Um, yeah, they always come with a story, and it's not always rational. It usually depends on. Um, some like faulty logic, which is usually something like this and this is always this way, or this and this needs to be a different way, or whatever. And yeah. like I often struggle with uh, feeling like I need to be more productive. Uh, and something I struggle with too is. I don't like when I don't feel that people are showing me respect. Uh, I don't, I guess I don't take blatant disrespect too well, but I can challenge the stories that come with those things. And I mean, it's hard. Some of it is just giving yourself time. Uh, and yeah, I think that that has been a huge aspect of uh, my like development or whatever. 
Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's psychological growth. Sorry, psycho uh, psychological growth. Yeah, uh, just like my psychological growth has been forgiving myself and yeah, like allowing myself to have feelings and. Um, That's beautiful. Forgiving myself, but still trying to challenge those stories. And so, like, for, back to a, a, a more direct example of like when I think I need to be more productive. I don't. I'm not. <laughs> That's not who I am right now. I'm not feeling productive. I don't feel I have the energy for it. If I try, it's just going to be hard to even think. Uh, and so, like, why, like, why force myself? That's something that I've been really been kind of vibing with lately is like just being reasonable. And I guess this doesn't sound very spiritual or non-dual or whatever, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, but no, but it's it's beautiful though. I mean, I mean, yeah. I, I think anyone with a, with a pulse, with a heart, is gonna think it's better to not beat yourself up over things and. It's better to feel more relaxed in the body than to feel stressed out over stories that are ultimately just that, just a story. But, but, but I guess, you know, since, you know, most of the viewers here, you know, or listeners are going to be, you know, coming to some degree from a non-duality background where these sorts of things aren't always talked about in the more radical non-duality circles of, um, you know, it's, it's more of a, um, focus on there's nothing to get out of this because there's no one to get anything and this is the sort of language and um perhaps you know experience or non-experience of those who use that language um but then yeah there's quite but then me personally i mean i, I feel yeah personally as a person I, I wonder what some of these people are like in their private lives and how that the non-duality um message or non-experience or whatever has affected them and i assume it is very much like what you're describing i the, the difference it seems to be to me is that there's less of an expectation that there's an end to anything or that there's a best way to be or like i like i definitely resonate with this with the idea of psychological growth or emotional healing i mean but you know for someone who's going to the self-help section of the bookstore they might be trying to get to an ultimate state or maybe maybe not i mean i shouldn't make that assumption i mean everyone's trying to heal and should to some degree if they have something that needs to be healed but i guess what i'm getting at is from the non-dual perspective you know all this is still just the story, the healing and the growth. Um, and yet on the relative level, it's very um, beautiful and important. And it, it makes life easier when you have less neuroticism and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, what, what would you say to people coming from that perspective that some people will probably hear what you're saying, what I'm saying and thinking that we're talking about trying to get somewhere or we're talking about trying to improve the situation for the character and that can seem like it's only going to create more suffering because you're reinforcing the idea that there is a character you know or that ending suffering is do you see what i'm getting at yeah i think so um yeah I mean, it's paradoxical, right? And so, like I was saying, it, it, it seems like one of the most productive ways to heal psychologically is effectively to do nothing about it, is to like forgive yourself and allow yourself to have it and see it. Um, and yeah. And like all of these things come into play, like they're not being a doer also, or not being a self. Uh, but I mean, I just feel like in my life thinking 
that way has not been as relevant for me personally. But I mean, to each their own, right? Right. Um, but I, I feel like I probably don't have a very different result. Um, because I mean, it's, it's different ways of pointing at the same thing, right? It's a different perspective it, 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 or whatever. Um, but I feel like the result is that I just kind of let myself happen. Um, like back to being reasonable, like I can't like stop myself from having anxiety. I can't stop myself from thinking what I do. I can't stop myself from caring about what I care about. Right. Um, so, yeah. And I think, I don't know, it's funny because, I mean, back to being things being paradoxical, it, it, it's like the best way to understand things is to not worry too much about understanding them, right? <laughs> yeah. And so, like, I, I almost feel like it doesn't really, like, it makes me think of a little bit of, like, how some people will change the words that they use when they've been exposed to spirituality. Like, they will start only referring to themselves as this body. Right. Or things like that. And I just don't, I mean, if it works for them, then sure. But like, I guess for me, I just don't see that it's really relevant because the concept behind whatever words could be completely different from person to person and they could mean the same thing. Right. Um, and so like, when I think of like, oh, I have to do this thing, like, I don't know, it's just, the story, I guess. It's just... Well, it, I don't you know. know. The, words, the words aren't what's important. They're not. They're not. And I think that's kind of a, sta a stepping stone, maybe, where you change your words to try to get your brain to think differently or, you know, your mind is trying to figure something out. Like you said, when you first started reading this Sargadatta and listening to Alan Watts, you know, there was something for your mind to chew on in that that was enjoyable and, and probably helpful on some level. But at a certain point, you realized there was nothing to really figure out. And, and at that point, what difference do the words make? Whether I say it's me having an experience or not having an experience, or whether it's me or just the body or just the character. You're right. These words are just sounds and what's behind them or i don't know i don't even know what's behind them but it would be di but it it's probably pretty different person to person like when you see the color green and i see the color green we have no way of even knowing if it's the same thing we're seeing right and it, it makes me think of like the question of like people trying to like figure out if anyone's really enlightened or not like right. who cares like they're who they are or <laughs> whatever you want to say like however you want to measure it is going to be subjective and based on perspective and all those things well i, I, well, I guess there's a yeah it's it's a, when i think about it i guess what comes to mind is you know as a as a ma mammal species that we evolved from you know, it, it's, I think we're sort of hardwired genetically to um, look to someone with confidence, the alpha of the tribe, and they're going to lead us to, the, you know, to, you know, fight off the lions or find the fruit, you know, or, you know, find food or shelter or protection. So we're sort of hardwired to exist as a pack, in a way, as a tribe, you know, humans are clearly extremely tribal animals and um and so 
yeah, so when somebody speaks with great confidence and say they're enlightened or say that they don't exist, you know, it, people tend to, you know, believe them and copy their language because, you know, it seems like they have a successful strategy that they want. You know, UG Krishnamurti said this is all just about pleasure seeking. You know, it's like enlightenment, the seek, seeking of enlightenment or the dropping away of the self or any of these things. It's just another form of, you know, the, the individual trying to seek a pleasure or be free from pain. And there's nothing wrong with that either, really. It's not something I think needs to be criticized. But yeah, I mean, those are my, what comes to my mind on it. But it, what was there a point when you used to like think, oh, this person's enlightened, that person isn't. And then at a certain point, you just stopped caring, like you said. I think so. I think it was actually pretty recently. Um, I think it probably still crosses my mind. I think I've just been interacting with that like side of Facebook. <laughs> like that's where most of my like spiritual conversation happens on Facebook. And um, I just haven't been interacting with that as much lately. So it's hard to say, I guess. Um, but yeah, I think it often would come up mostly when I felt that someone was being unreasonable or like, yeah, I mean, that pretty much sums it up. And I was like, definitely have the thought cross my mind, like, oh, this person's obviously like attached to this or whatever. Um, but yeah, I guess it, it also kind of came with my like somewhat more recent departure from that space a bit. It's just like, I don't really care as much. And I think that's some, been something that's been kind of like spreading throughout my life in general is like kind of a positive not really caring. <laughs> um, because I feel like I used to think a lot about like wanting to get somewhere with my life or like having recognition and more money and like you know the typical thing yeah and um yeah i just uh, I, I mean it's just like apparent in every little thing that happens that uh, like it's gonna be fleeting and it is fleeting now. And fleeting. I don't know. It's also just kind of out of mind lately, too. Yeah. Like, yeah, I don't know. Well, you know, some, some speakers say that this is ordinary. It's a common word for it. And, and there's this saying, you know, before awakening, chop wood, carry water. After awakening, chop wood, carry water. Right. Nothing special. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's something I was thinking earlier, is I just kind of view what is reasonable and what is, like, functional and what I enjoy. Um, yeah, I think that's been something I've been really getting in touch with too lately. Just being able to focus on what I enjoy and want to do naturally and what I care about naturally. And uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it's pretty straightforward that I would make life feel more fulfilling, which I guess it does. Uh, not that. I don't know. I guess that's something that I feel I enjoy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Paul Hederman, you know, the speaker, he, he says that if you try to use non-duality to solve the problems of duality, it doesn't really work. But 
something about this uh, this message, this approach, whatever. It's um, the character tends to travel lighter as a byproduct, just sort of naturally. And that's kind of what I'm hearing from what you're saying is there's less of trying to like figure something out and that relaxes you. And there's less of a trying to, you know, get to an end point, you know, and or is that fair to say? Yeah, that's definitely true. Um... I definitely used to be much more concerned with like achieving some state as well that would be like different <laughs> or like a, a permanent uh, change of perspective but just like watching like like a permanent out of body experience or something um, but I just I don't care as much anymore I mean I don't that's actually something I think about very little. Uh, I think it's actually been several years that my main concerns really have been more around psychological health and not really any sort of like spiritual end goal. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like lately I've been feeling less spiritual, more functional, but I definitely feel that it's still like heavily influenced by like philosophical and spiritual ideas i mean that's just how i live my life i guess yeah yeah but, makes sense to me yeah gosh yeah. Well, mm. i kind of feel that it it it's almost like rather than going out and trying to find like someone else's network of ideas to try and make work, I I am just like taking just what I need, right? Um, and so what that means to me is just like the psychological, emotional hurdles that I encounter. Um, I only use what I need to confront any negative self-talk or whatever it might be, or uh, something very valuable too is just like tools to calm down, like just focusing on your breath and like feeling it in your body and like yeah um i don't know i just i guess i just find that valuable to me right and, and, and i think and i think just to yeah the, the, what i'm getting from what you're saying there is that like these are practical um, tools and practices that help calm your mind and body, but you're not necessarily trying to become enlightened from them or reach some permanent state from them necessarily. No, it's more of just like having compassion for myself, I guess. Yeah. Uh, as well as, I mean, I mean, it's, it's, I feel like it's not really different than wanting to play some video games or caring about uh, my co-op I work for and wanting to do work for it because I care. Um, it, it's just like what naturally happens. It's what I naturally want to do. It's like this body just naturally wants to like try and improve its situation. And it's just, I mean, I think there's also a degree of just enjoying, uh, like, like we've talked about before, like, I just kind of enjoy being a little, like, a little ritualistic, a little methodical. Um, and, like, I do enjoy logic and intellect, intellectual things. And so just, like, understanding my psychology and seeing seeing what happens, seeing my triggers or whatever, however you want to say it, seeing the things that influence my emotions, uh, like, what they are, how they are, the stories around it. And, yeah, it's just interesting as well um so i guess i'm 
fortunate in that way, maybe. But uh, whatever. <laughs> Do. Um, yeah, it, it's acknowledging and appreciating what the experience is of being in this body, of existing as this in the way that you exist, as I exist. And that's going to be different person to person. Yeah, and I think that's totally something that I valued when I was interested in Osho is that's one of his big talking points is being yourself. Um, and so I guess that's like pretty fundamental to how I live my life as well. It's just like allowing myself to be myself. And these are the things I like to do. These are the things that are relevant to me. And however they got there, uh, it's me. <laughs> Yeah, and and over and it sounds like over time there's been like less of a feeling that there's a better that you shouldn't be that way, or that there's that that's where so much suffering comes for people, where they think, oh, I'm still thinking thoughts. I must be doing a horrible job at being non-dual or a meditator or spiritual. I'm still having emotions. What's wrong with me? Look at you know Osho or whoever. People just look at these gurus, and some of them will think that they're in, existing in some whole other paradigm where there's no one there anymore and that means that they don't ever get sad or angry or something right when, when that can create more suffering because then there's judgment on top of the emotions and thoughts like oh i shouldn't be having these thoughts i shouldn't be feeling this emotion whereas what you're describing is you, like you said earlier there's a there's sort of an apparent paradox there where when you stop trying to change it it actually might relax on its own a little bit yeah and that's that's totally like a thing is when you stop having to like yourself you start to like yourself <laughs> i don't know i mean there's something about it that does just make it like i, I feel that something that happens when you're really caught up in a negative emotion, a negative story, is you often like seek validity in your in your feeling or in your anger as though you didn't have it. Um, and often what people will do is to like elaborate on the story to further support themselves or whatever. And um, I mean, it's it just gets in the way, right? Well, what, you know, lately, I think we've talked about this before, but I, you know, I've, I've, I find the topic of narcissism very interesting in this respect because it's exactly what you're describing. It's, it actually comes from a place of insecurity and this feeling that there needs to be a solid sense of self. And so it's projected out onto the world, this image of this is what I am. And, and there's this constant, you know, attachment and almost addiction to getting feedback about this. You know, look at me, I am this, acknowledge me for being this. And, and, and I think everyone has that to some degree. I think that's just part of being human, but some more than others and some in ways that are healthier and less healthy than others. But yeah that's what are your thoughts on that um yeah i mean i guess to some degree i just try and not worry about it too much um i think that's been kind of my answer for a lot of things is i think very often we're able to think i, th I think this is kind of what i was trying to get at with uh like trying to elaborate on the story usually is not productive is we're, we're usually able to think more than we're able to do. And so um, I, I really try and just like make headspace for like what I need to do, I guess. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I just like keep to my business in a way but not in in a like strict way, not in a like shutting other 
people outweigh just like uh for my own head and just for what's practical because i can only do so much and so like i take care of myself and my relationships and yeah yeah i i, I guess i brought that up because you know you I, it's something that yeah i guess i'm just bringing up my own thing because that was something i've struggled with that um dealing with people who are narcissistic and you've been a helpful friend to me through some of that time you've you've actually given a lot of helpful insights and when i try to think about it your insights were mostly just very practical of just if something doesn't feel good you don't need it in your life it's really as simple as that and beyond that you're right you don't need to understand anything you're not going to really understand anything anyway so there's no need to try to figure anything out you know, sticking to what you're drawn to. Well, maybe there is to some degree, but you, um, you're talking, yeah, the way you're talking, it just makes me think, you know, just how simple, you know, the simplicity, um, just always has the answer, you know, and it's not an answer. It's just, you know, one step at a time, like the, like the Buddhist walking meditation. It's like that. Like there's no need to think about a future that doesn't exist. You just do what's practical for now. Right. I mean, that does actually sometimes include thinking about the future. But I feel that I've gotten better and better at only thinking about the future as much as it seems practical. Yeah. Uh, and yeah yeah it's unique for everybody and you don't really um assume what might i mean yeah your perspective your perspective on all of this might change dramatically in a year or two you have no way of knowing i guess so yeah um i mean that's definitely something that i've carried with me is just that um, nothing's really certain. And one of my favorite things to say, actually, um, because I just feel like it's so real, it's so to the point, and it, it's easy for people to understand. Is just we'll see. Um, like we don't know yet, and yeah, I've, I've actually found that useful in in talking to people sometimes when they are speaking in like absolutist terms or like uh, that things are ab absolutely this way or things will absolutely turn out this way. And um, my response is usually we'll see because things aren't set in stone, like what we understand of things is only partial. And so we should, yeah, it, it's just like a constantly being ready to be surprised, I guess. Yeah. And then maybe just feeling the okayness of whatever is arising right now. I guess so, yeah. I mean, it's funny because, like, in the end, like, there's so many different aspects you can talk about. There's so many different, like, of these common human stories that grow these spiritual or philosophical explanations. But in the end, it really is, like, uh, I mean, the best way that I've found to put it is, like, just, like, going to the raw experience of it. Because, like, we can try and talk about it and explain things and um, understand these different aspects and these different pointers. But it does kind of come back to that like experience without thought. But like, thought, I mean, it's funny because thought can be there, but it's just like that, you know, that presence or whatever, that space. Um, yeah. And 
I don't know. I mean, it's like there's like there's I think there's a lot that you can take away from. the concept that like no understanding is going to be final or it's going to like really hit it like and, and I don't know there's something about like looking at like your raw experience that just like makes it really stark that what you think about what is happening and what is happening are completely different worlds um and yeah and so like I, i've said a couple times that like i i have my thoughts about things but a lot of the time it's just kind of out of mind is uh yeah i guess a lot of overthinking comes from like yeah trying to solve things and trying to grasp it trying to un understand it and i guess i've just been not so concerned with that And so, yeah, I just don't think about it so much. <laughs> well, I think that's probably a good note to end on, Ben. I mean, it's a beautiful point. <laughs> I mean, cool. really appreciate you having this talk. Sure. Thanks for inviting me. And I appreciate uh, you and getting to talk to you. And yeah. Thank you. Is, is there anything you'd like to um, promote or anything like that or tell people about of your uh, um, Not really. I guess something that comes to mind, if anyone's interested, is I have, I mean, it's pretty outdated at this point, um, but I did write a book. I, I sent it to you at one point. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I guess that's the thing. It just popped into my head. Um, if if people want to find that yeah. book, would, would they just contact you personally, or is it on Amazon or anything? I don't. I don't feel that. Uh, I don't know actually what kind of viewership this will get, but I don't know that it'll be you know, a massive amount of people. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it it was just off the top of my head. I guess people can contact me directly. I'm on Facebook, Ben Finka. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, yeah, thanks again for the talk, Ben. And I'll stop the recording. Sure. Okay. <laughs>